What's up everyone? Welcome to this video on coral counting. Okay, so coral counting is actually from this book, uh, Coral Counting and Counting Collections. And it's basically a number sense routine that I want us to dig into, specifically a team building uh, routine. The reason being students have to work together and build off of each other's answers and kind of help each other through it in order to complete the routine. Now, let's not get this twisted. Coral counting is not just a counting activity like you would think of with like kindergarten, that one-to-one -one counting. It does have students count. However, students are looking for patterns along the way. So students are counting, the teacher's recording it, and the students are looking for patterns based off what they see. So I just wanna be clear, we're gonna go through some examples, but I just wanna be clear, coral counting is not just for primary grades. There's upper elementary coral counting routines that you can implement as well. Okay, so keep that in mind. I wanna go through now the structure of this routine. Okay, so as always, I'm gonna make you do some work. I want you to take a look at this number grid and I want you to pause the video and Think about what patterns you notice or what's something that you notice on this number grid. Okay, so hopefully you notice that it's increasing by ones as you're counting to the right or horizontally. But even more specifically on this, you can notice that the ones digit remains the same in every other row. So for example, if you're looking at the one, there's a one there and in the number 11, there's a one in the ones place, for the number three, obviously three is in the ones place, and then a couple rows down, 13 has three in the ones place. So there's that pattern of every other row has the same number in the ones place. Now the same goes for the rest of the rows, right? So if we're looking at the number six, six is in the ones place, and then if you're looking at the number 16, six is in the ones place there as well. So also proving that every other row has the same digit in the ones place. Now, these aren't just a bunch of random numbers put together because if I were to end that first row with the number six instead of with the number five, that would most likely change the pattern that the students would be seeing. So it's not just a random counting put together, there's some reasoning behind this. And the planning starts off with the number grid. So I had mentioned that the number grid is it's what we just looked at. This is a coral counting planning sheet that I made for everyone. Um, and let's just take a look at it. You start off with that number grid and you have to really be specific in how you place the numbers. Now, we just saw the numbers go horizontally, but I'll show you some number grids that go vertically as well. So you want to be really intentional about what your columns and rows look like. Okay, so let's try another example. I told you that I would show you a vertical number grid as well. So here is a different number grid. Notice we're going from 16, now we're going down, we're skip counting down to 21 and then 26. So I want you to pause the video and just jot down any patterns that you may notice on this number grid. Okay, so our first pattern is that we are skip counting or we're having the students skip count by fives. However, notice it's skip counting by fives with a weird number to start with, right? We're not starting with the number five. We're actually skip counting from the number 16. We're not even skip counting from the number 15, which would be easier for them to do. So we're having students skip count by the number five. And again, the teacher is jotting it down vertically instead of horizontally. Another pattern to notice is as you're going across, it's actually increasing by 20. So 16 and 20 more would be 36 and so on and so on and so on. So there's a second pattern in here. And another pattern is that the ones digit actually remains the same or not the same, but it alternates. So the ones digit has a six and then a one and then a six and then a one. So as you can see here, it's alternating in the rows. So three different patterns, just based off one number grid. And that's where the second part of this piece comes in. We really, again, have to be intentional with what our number grids look like, but we also wanna be intentional on what we want the pattern to be for students to see, right? So this last one that I just gave you as an example had three different patterns on it. Now, the next section of this template is anticipated responses. 
So you really want to jot down here exactly what that says. We want to jot down what we think students will find. So perhaps in that last number grid, they wouldn't have been able to see the increase of 20, right? Or perhaps an anticipated response is that they would revert back to counting by fives in the typical way we count by fives. Like, let's talk about the structure of how you want to implement this routine. So we start off by choosing the number that we want to count by. So that's starting number. And then we think about how we want our number grid to look. Then you're going to tell the students that they will have to count out loud, right, together. And you're going to record the counts that they say. You're keeping in mind how you want that number grid to look like, but they're just counting as you're writing down. And obviously when you're having them count, you always want to let them know what number they're starting with and what they're going to skip count by. Now, it is very important that you jot down what the students say. So you have to do the recording here. And you have to do the recording here even if there's errors, right? Because we want students to catch that. Now, I've seen some people implement some choral counting routines without having this written component to it. It doesn't, it's just not effective that way. That's just having students just count out loud. The whole point of this is to see structures and patterns and numbers. So you have to record what they're saying. Now, it's just not about counting and recording. We really want to be strategic in where we pause during the, the choral count. So I want you to pause at really specific points. And I even want you to plan that ahead of time. Like where in this number grid am I going to pause to ask them what patterns do you notice so far? Do you know what the next number will be? Will the number, I don't know, um, 27 appear in our count? Will it be coming up? And if so, you ask them why. How do you know? Why not? So stopping and asking these questions is really, really important. So then you finish the count with the class, and then you're getting into those strategic questions, right? So you pause and you kind of did a check-in on them, and now you're asking them, all right, we see the whole number grid. What patterns are you noticing here? Just like what we did in those examples before. And then you're going to ask them how they figured out the pattern. Now, you do want to ask them what would happen if they continued the pattern and obviously how they know that would happen. So, okay, looking at this example, we're having students count. We told them what to start with. We told them what they're going to count by. You're recording as they count. You're pausing somewhere. Let's say you strategically pause on the number 41. Do a check-in. What do you notice so far? Blah, blah, blah. Continue on with the count until you want that number grid complete, until, you know, what you planned. And then asking those um, extension questions, right? So, all right, guys, this is the number grid. What, what patterns do we see? What do you notice? What are you wondering? What do we think will come next? Is the number 106 gonna come up in our number grid if we keep going? So questions like that. Choral counting is just not about counting forward. It's about counting backwards as well. So I want you to take a look at this example. We're starting off with 2,740. So obviously this is for students that are in upper elementary. And then if you notice, we're gonna have students count back from 100. And then this time I'm also uh, using the number grid, I'm writing it vertically. All right, but I want you to pause and I want you to think about, we know that the pattern so far is that you're decreasing by 100, right? So you should see that hundreds place decreasing. We have seven in the hundreds place at first, then six in the hundreds place, five, so on and so on. What other pattern do you notice here? I'm hoping that you notice, and you know, as adults, we even have to get used to this ourselves, right? Because we're not technically used to even doing this routine. So we have to kind of get used to it and looking for patterns as well. So anyways, I'm hoping you notice that as you're looking at from the left-hand column to the right-hand column, that there's an increase, I'm sorry, there's a decrease of a thousand. Now, let me give you another upper elementary example, because this is not just whole numbers, right? This is also, I mean, you could use it literally for anything. So now we're going to take a look at fractions. So here's my number grid for fractions. I'm hoping you notice that I am skip counting or having the class skip count by one fourth. So you see one fourth, two fourths, three fourths. Then I wrote a whole and not the four fourths. I added that in later. I know you can see that, but that's what I did. Then I went one and one fourth, one and two fourths, so on and so on. But I put that hole on the bottom. There's a reason for that. Besides you seeing the pattern of the increase of one fourth, 
What other pattern can you find on here? Okay, so I'm hoping that you see that, that as you're going across, it is increasing by one whole. So if you look at that first row, you have one fourth, then you have one and one fourth, so that was one whole more, and then you have two and one fourth, which is another whole added. And again, that is actually why I put the holes on the bottom, it goes one, two, three, in order for students to hopefully make that connection that's on the bottom to the top. Isn't that so cool? I mean, like, there's some, like, deep thinking behind all this. Okay, so measurement comes into play with this as well. Pause the video, find any patterns. All right, I'm going to give you a couple. So first we started off with six inches, and then we're increasing by uh, 24 inches. So from six inches, add 24, that gives us 30. So we're increasing that way. The next thing to notice is that I highlighted where one foot is, where two feet is, then three feet. So students would have to predict, well, will four feet be shown on this chart, is it? Um, what about five feet? What about six feet? If six feet is not here, how much would that be? So those are some different questionings that could go around even measurement. And lastly, I know this is another measurement, but um, I wanted to show you that you could actually use this for math stories or word problems as well. So for example, let's say I put up a word problem here and I say, um, at the time I'm filming this, it's like around Halloween. So what if I say, uh, how many four ounce candies are in a three pound bag, right? So students can use that coral counting routine and actually figure out what would one pound be, two pounds, three pounds, and so forth. Obviously they would look for patterns here as well. What are they skip counting by? How is it increasing? Things like that. Now here's an example of how to use this resource. As you can see here, I have that number grid. I have the patterns that I want students to see. I have some anticipated responses of what I think students will do, all different types of students, what I think they'll say. Then I have exactly where I want to pause strategically on that number grid and what I wanna say when I pause, like what are my questions going to be? Um, and then the next steps, that's a really important part because coral counting is a routine that you can continue, right? And I just showed you a bunch of different examples that you can do with a ton of different standards. So it doesn't end after one coral count, but you do have to see what your next step should be because if it didn't go well or go as planned, then you have to kind of think about where it went wrong, where it went sideways, and how to kind of correct it from there. Or if it went really well, how can you continue going further and push the kids on? So as I mentioned earlier, Coral counting is not just a primary skill where students are counting by ones and tens, which is typically what we think of when we think about coral counting. I'm hoping you can see the benefit of it being used really throughout all grade levels, and this is even past elementary school, but I'm hoping elementary teachers, you can see it used in very standards, fractions, decimals, money, time. I mean, you can use it for so much.